Welcome to Live Life in the Spirit. We are your hosts. I'm Pastor Penny Schultz. And I'm Kristen Sharon. Have you ever really wondered why God caused a flood? Why did all of humanity have to be destroyed? And how does all of this link to the little book of Enoch? If you've ever question, had those questions yourself, tune in today. Join us as adventurers through God's Word, the Holy Lands, and beyond, exploring the fascinating and the weird, the difficult and the obscure. Come and see how the stories are woven together and how they still apply to our lives today. We promise to bring you joy, hope, inspiration, and intriguing out-of-the-box thinking, and ultimately, salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, if we want to get back to this time of Enoch, we've been alluding that we were going to dive into that, and that's really where we're at. So why we talked about Jude and stuff is because he's he's one of the few, he and Peter, who talk about that fallen realm, and then there's other ones that have um, scripture references, but he has direct quotes right. from there. But where was Enoch? It says, actually in the book of Enoch, it says all this stuff happened. Everything went down with the fallen realm, and when they took wives, but it all happened in the days of Jared. Now, when we hear this, we may think that, oh, then that means that once Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, boom, right away, that's when everything happened. That's kind of what we feel like. Absolutely. But it says in the days of Jared, and when was Jared? He was the dad of Enoch, so we've had how many years? Um, you know, we've looked into the math a little bit on that, about 650 years. Yeah. So this all was about 1,033 to almost 1,200 years before the flood is when Jared was born and when he would have been on the earth. Most people don't realize Jared literally lived like five years less than Methuselah. So when Methuselah was the oldest man, Jared was pretty darn close behind. So he had a long life that a lot of bad things could happen during. Exactly. We're talking, we're talking over... Um, well, a millennial. <laughs> almost, yeah. For him, mm -hmm. but during that time, it was almost a millennial. So to give you an idea of what really was going on, we've alluded to Enoch, you can go read it. You can read it for free online. You just type in the Book of Enoch free. And But we're talking about false prophecies. Prophets, there are actually three books of Enoch that I didn't even know about, and two of them are actually false right. that have a lot of issues with them. They're not... They're not anywhere close to what they would have read and considered even historical right literature. So the one that we read, just to give you a synopsis of what happened. So Mount Hermon, which is in the northern part of Israel, has been always the mountain that the fallen realm has claimed. That's where they descended, and that's where they've made oaths, and that's where they made pacts. And, and you'll see that throughout all of the scriptures, that that's basically their, their mountain. And the base of which is the gates of hell and all of the with the things that we talked about, the Grotto of Pan, and there's a temple to Zeus, and several other, I mean, this is when you want to worship the fallen realm. Well, when the tribe of Dan broke off from Israel because they went and lined with the fallen realm, they are right there at the base of Mount Hermon. So what happens is, I always said they're called watchers. Not all watchers are bad. And you may not know that because you just type in a watcher angels and what do you get? You get the 200 that fell. That fell the sin. But there was a lot of angels that fell. And there was a lot of good angels that were put down to watch over humanity. It's probably where we get the whole guardian angel concept. Absolutely. They've all been given countries, nations to rule. Uh, they all have jobs. They all have jobs. They don't just sit on clouds playing harps. That's not the angelic realm. Each has each angel has a purpose. Has a purpose in God's grand scheme of plan. Yeah. So Shemiaza, which is one of them, he's one of the main. He um, is the one that convinces the other two hundred that we're going to do this plan. We're going to take these women as our wives. We're going to have offspring. The point was yes to rule and subdue, but it was bigger than that. He wanted to defile the DNA mm -hmm. of man. Dirty the seed. So that way Jesus could not come from a pure line. Even back then, from the very beginning, it started. And we saw that in Genesis when it said, 
seed of the woman with the seed of the serpent seraph mm -hmm. would be an animosity throughout. So that's what they do. So the watchers take 200 of the women, and um, but he alone did not want to be punished for the sin, and so he makes them take an oath right there at Mount Hermon, and they do. Right, because he's like, I think maybe I'm going to do it and you're not, so we're going to all agree to mess up really bad together. Mm -hmm. So the scriptures imply by them taking human wives that this was not of the consent from the human race, and I pretty much always said that. I mean, the scriptures are pretty poignant on the word, the Hebrew word for take. Mm -hmm. So their offspring, though, between the angelic realm and the human realm is where we get the word Nephilim. They're half-breeds. And I hadn't given this a thought before, but, you know, polygamy was the norm back then. So it's very reasonable to believe that each angel could have had more than one wife, could have taken many. So as if falling away from God were not enough, the watchers add to their guilt by interposing themselves in the role that should, should alone be reserved for God. The watchers impose themselves over mankind by becoming gods. Mm -hmm. And that's where all of the all the things we talked about with Return of the Gods and the stuff we talked about before that, why you need to know, everything that's happening, right there. In this role, and at the behest of Azazel, one of their number, they begin to systematically share their teachings to mankind on a number of subjects. All the forbidden subjects that they were never supposed to tell. And right, that, that was... For him, metallurgy was a big thing. It was making war, it was making swords, it was making armor, all this stuff. We, we brushed on that a little bit last mm -hmm. week. We did. But that's why Azazel is um, really, really punished by God. Well, it's Shemi Azza who had the idea, and he's the one who defiled the people. Azazel takes it one step farther. He interferes with their walk with God even more. Okay, so here's the thought, and I may be way out on left field here, but we don't know who the serpent or the seraph was in the garden. Could That's it have been Azazel? Absolutely. Because what was it that he said? If you eat of this tr fruit, you will be like God. God. It was all about knowing. It was knowing good and evil. It, was, it wasn't the fruit from the tree of life. It was the fruit from the knowledge. The, the knowledge. It was all about knowledge. And so he's eating that fruit opened the door, but it didn't give him everything. No, no, it didn't. And the angels, though, the fallen ones, continued and continue today. Yes. So when you see that, they were teaching them all the things that they shouldn't have. And with these wives that they were taking, and I would go so far as to say that that's probably where you get uh, for the most part, the wicked covenants of women. Because, and what do they talk about? It's the herbs, and it's the roots, and it's the, you know, everything to do with her. Well, what was it as Azazel taught him? It was the herbs. It was the, the cutting the of cutting. roots. We're not just chopping a tree. You know, we talk about it. It's, um, um, we're going to get, we're going to devote an entire program to just this one particular root and this one particular um, herb that is making it come back again. It is called ayahuasca, and it is huge. You may never have heard of it. Um, they will say that if you ask anyone under the age of 30, they will know about it. I've asked a couple, and they didn't, but it is out there. And this is not new. This drug has been around since the very beginning of time. And it's unlike anything that we've ever heard of or experienced. Because it taps into the spiritual realm, right? And it's that's the cutting that. of the root. That's where that comes from. Yes. To be continued on that discussion. To be continued, yes. <laughs> one of those little sidetracks. Uh, so anyway, that's why Azazel is the one who really, really gets in trouble. Big, big, big time. Not that the other wasn't bad enough. But it, God says that there is no redemption for you. You will be chained. You will be, you're going to stay here in time out until the end when you are judged. So we can't imagine what he really did. <laughs> but it, it was... <laughs> it had to have been completely off the charts. If you think about that time, we said that there was over a thousand years from the days of Jared 
a thousand to twelve hundred years before the flood. All this corruption. The Nephilim were horrid. I mean, they did terrible things to humanity. They were half-breeds. They were grotesque. They, they were consuming all of Earth, and they started consuming people, and they started consuming each other. And then, so from that union between man and angels, where the Nephilim come from, and they were, we were vile. But I want you to think about this. Well, it talks about no redemption for Azazel, a judgment for others. But it says there's no redemption or forgiveness for the Nephilim. Well, why would that be? Because the angels fell from grace. Man fell from grace. The Nephilim are the offspring of both fallen humanity and the fallen angelic beings. The giants are never spoken of having fallen from God's grace. Um, they're not even given an opportunity to repent or to obey God. They're bad from the beginning. <laughs> they are. They consumed everything on earth, including people. The corruption in the world proceeds from bad to worse, as we were told the giants. They were not satisfied with just ruling over and consuming humanity. But then they also began to sin against the animal kingdom that led in ways to corruption of the entire world. And that is what Genesis tells us with Noah. The whole world was so corrupt. corrupt. And then... What does the fallen realm do best? They take it to the next level, and not only were they turning on each other, but they were drinking each other's blood, and, and that is the biggest no-no. Because -no. blood is the lifeline. That is um, what God has called sacred. That's why the blood for the, why the sacrifice is the blood. It's the redemption process, and they defile that. We see that everything is going bad, and Enoch comes on the scene. He was born about mm, 1033 before the flood. And so he would have had <laughs> much chances to interact with the watchers. Oh, I mean, he lived during that time. This is during the days of Jared. But he would have interacted with both those who fell and those who did not. Right. He mm -hmm. knew the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And the judgment of God against the watchers and their children having been determined, it is Enoch who is sent to preach God's decree to the sinning angels at Mount Hermon. So a lot of people, when they think about, oh, they scoff the book of Enoch, and this is just like one man's crusade, you know, or no, 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 no. God chose Enoch. This is why I think he didn't die. He had been preserved. He had been set apart during that time for such a time as this. That's right. So he's sent to preach God's decree at where? At Mount Hermon. <laughs> Which is a mountain. And the, the Lord has Enoch tell them that they will see their offspring turn on one another, kill each other, and then that they will perish in the flood. And then the 200 will be bound in chains and cast into the abyss, Tartarus, mm -hmm. as was Azazel before them. So he's already been dealt with, and then the rest of them will be. And there they will remain for a period of 70 generations, after which time they will be finally judged and cast into eternal flames. Okay, this is where I would argue that I don't know that Azazel actually procreated with humans. Might not have, because he was taken earlier. He was taken earlier, and part of the punishment was for the 200. It said the 200 will be bound and change. He was already there, and they had to watch their offspring be destroyed. That was part of the punishment. You created this problem, right. and you're now gonna you're going to watch it. Is it destructs itself. But Azazel was not a part of that. Now, if that name sounds familiar, if we've talked about this at the Old Testament, at the holiest day of the year, in the fall, it's Yom Kippur. It's right after the Feast of Trumpets, after the Jewish New Year. During Yom Kippur, there are two goats that are offered up. One will become the sacrifice, the other becomes the scapegoat scapegoat and where does that scapegoat go well i think it's interesting tell them first what do they ceremonially do like what does that goat become or take right. on so they cast the lots and the lot that falls on the scapegoat 
all of the sins of the people are placed onto this goat. The other goat is still unblemished. And that's what's offered up for the sacrifice, for the forgiveness of all. But all these sins are heaped upon the scapegoat, and it is sent out into the wilderness to Azazel. Azazel. That's another one of those little random scriptures that if you have no clue about this whole story, it doesn't make any sense. Because you're going to go, who? Who in the world is Azazel? And why does he get a goat? Right. <laughs> 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 but he was buried in the desert below and rocks were put on him and all this kind of stuff. But those 200 there will remain there for a period of 70 generations. After which, then they will be finally judged and cast into the eternal flame. So, 70 generations, we think, until the end of time. Well, no. Not necessarily. That's not what it says. And it says they will be judged. I will still argue <coughs> that depending on the words you use, um, that there's still hope. There's always hope for redemption. Now, with Azazel, that is flat out there. Right. God says there is no hope for redemption for you. Well, after hearing uh, God's decree, when Enoch comes back, so he's kind of like the, the lawyer for him. <laughs> he, he has the dream, and, and he had pleaded their case. He'd even written it down, I said, and he comes back after he has the dream of what to tell the watchers. And they're greatly troubled, and they requested he not go and petition on their behalf. Notice the angels did not go to God. Now, I know that they were cast down here. But Satan goes up and he talks with God. So you know that Satan wasn't part of the 200. Right. But I just wonder, why did they pick Enoch to go talk to God? It does make you wonder. Other angels could go talk to God. They could have talked to God. They could have said they're sorry. Now, that's why I said it depends on the translation and how you really word it. But basically, all they were wanting was pardon for what they had done. They weren't asking for forgiveness. They were sorry they got caught. But they were not Your judgment sorry is what too they harsh. Did. Please judge us more favorably. <laughs> and they weren't crying for what they had done. They were just crying for the fact that their offspring, these creatures, were going to be destroyed. They, they are more worried about not wanting what they created destroyed. Because they wanted to be like God, right? This reminds me of another story in the Old Testament about David. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? And his punishment was that his son would die. Now, but God told him that your son will die. And he fell prostrate on the ground for the whole time. He cried and he cried and he everything. He prayed and he pleaded and he did everything he could to get God to change his mind. And God said no. He didn't. So <laughs> this isn't new. This is, There's nothing new under the sun. No. So this paraphrase of Enoch declares his vision, God's judgment, is that the watchers are not to be forgiven and the giants are not to be granted an extension of their lives and Azazel is to be bound and the giants are to be destroyed and the remaining watchers are to be bound in the abyss, Tartarus, until the final judgment. With the remaining sinning watchers still free, they'd been sentenced, but they were not yet imprisoned. Um, so Gabriel, another one of the angels that we hear mentioned in the Bible, incites the children of the watchers to war. So it was already said, you know, it was declared that they would have to all die, and they're just helping the process along a little bit. Mm -hmm. So civil war breaks out among the giants about 120 years before the flood, which that makes sense because they were allowed to live 120 years. For more than a century, the war will rage until the giants are wiped from the planet. In order to speed the process of, up of their destruction, the angels throw stones from heaven upon the giants on earth. I have thoughts on that. Uh, throughout the duration of the giants' civil war, the watchers not yet bound in the abyss are witness to the destruction of their children and are utterly powerless to stop it. You know, when you, you think of this, you, you can't help but go, oh, geez, we are right there by the Serpent Mound, which supposedly <laughs> the giants are buried. And it's a massive It's 25 pile. feet tall of rocks on top of one another, and it snakes for how many miles? One or two miles? It's, it's quite like one, one and a half. half. Yeah. yeah. 25 feet tall, one and a half miles long. 
And some of those rocks are way bigger oh, than humans could pick huge. up. Huge. Hmm. Interesting. Now these angelic human hybrids are pronounced to a unique judgment. As disembodied spirits, not created by God, they're doomed to roam the earth as evil spirits. In this role, they will hunger and thirst and yet not eat or drink, and they will serve as a source of trouble for sinful humanity until the final judgment. And then Michael buys Shemyaza and casts him into the abyss, and the rest of the sinning watchers are also bound and cast into the abyss. Jesus, the 70th generation from Methuselah, rises from the dead and ascends victorious into heaven. But before, he dies and he descends to Tartarus to preach to the captives. And who are the captives? It's the 200 of the fallen realm in the abyss. You know, there is an interesting thing that there is an order of progression. All this is orders of progression throughout the Bible. Um, it's the heaven, <laughs> the earth, the abyss, and finally the lake of fire where they're thrown into. But when you put those in order, and I'm going to put them up on for those who are watching this on the podcast, um, if you take the H from heaven, the E from earth, and the A from abyss, and the L from lake, it makes heal. And Enoch 10, verse 7, and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted, and proclaim the healing of the earth that may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish, though all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught to their sons. So Enoch, before the flood, was prophesying that. Lord, heal the land. Interesting. You wonder if he ever had a flash of the flood. It's possible. Well, that is a lot of information and about a book most people don't even know exists. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> of course, it can be said for the fallen realm, too, that they don't realize. Doesn't mean it's not Doesn't happening. Doesn't mean it's not happening out there. But I don't know about you, my brain's a little fried. I think it's time for... Joy Break! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Moses, and an old man were playing golf in heaven one day, and at the tenth hole, they all hit shots that landed in the water trap. When they got to the hole, Moses stepped up to the water trap and parted the water, <laughs> walked to his ball, and hit a shot that landed about two feet from the cup. He stepped up to the ball and landed a putt for par on that hole. Jesus walked on the water, hit his ball for a shot that landed about two inches from the cup, and he walked up to it and landed the putt for par also. The old man waded into the water and hit his ball, and a fish jumped out of the water to catch it. Before the fish fell back in the water, an eagle flew down, caught the fish as it was flying, and as it was flying over the hole, the fish dropped the ball, and it went into the cup for a birdie. Moses turned to Jesus and said, Gee, I just hate playing golf with your dad. <laughs> to say just so you know maybe that one was challenging <laughs> so this one is in honor of school starting and all of the teachers who are back in the classroom did you hear the one about the teacher who was helping one of her kindergarten students put on his boots he asked for help and she could see why with her pulling him with her pulling and him pushing the boots still did not want to go on when the second boot was on, she had worked up quite a sweat. She almost whimpered when the little boy said, Teacher, they're on the wrong feet. She looked, and sure enough, they were. It wasn't any easier pulling the boots off than it was putting them on. She managed to keep her cool as together they worked to get the boots back on, this time on the right feet. He then announced, These aren't my boots. She bit her tongue rather than to get right in his face and scream, Why didn't you say so? like she really wanted to. So once again, she struggled to help him pull the ill-fitting boots off. And then he said, they're my brother's boots. Mom made me wear them. She didn't know if she should laugh or cry, so she mustered up the grace and courage she had left to wrestle the boots on his feet once again. Now she said, where are your mittens? And he said, I stuffed them in the toes of my boots. 
Her trial starts next month. <laughs> <laughs> In a world full of falsehood and lies and all the disinformation that's coming at us, it can be really hard to tell the truth. And the truth can seem pretty different. But you know what? That's why we chose these shirts for today. Because here, on this place, get, get used, used to, to different. different. Well, with all those meat and potatoes, I'm about stuffed. I don't know about you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that was a lot to chew on. It was a lot to chew on. And it begs the question, what, what do, do you do with that? that? If you are a person that is hearing all of this for the first time, we get it. We've all been there at one time. And maybe for some of you, this is old hat because you've even read the Book of Enoch and you've studied on it and you've watched a lot of other uh, videos or podcasts regarding Enoch. <clears throat> either way, we know that we are hitting a crowd that is somewhere on either end of the spectrum and all the way in between. That's why we're going back and we're trying to take these big concepts, these big words and put it into layman's terms that you can understand because it has to be something that we can we understand. understand. I don't like big words. I just, that's not how I preach because that's not how I retain things or understand them easily. Because if, if a new idea is thrown at, out at me and I need to think about it, I don't want to have to sit there looking up in the dictionary what the definition of the word is that they use. I would already know that so I can be thinking about what my mind is chewing on and not, not big words. Not delve into big words. That's right. Yeah, I guess I'm pretty simple after all. <laughs> so what do you do with Enoch? Enoch, the seventh from Adam. The son of Jared in the time of Jared, when all the chaos, you think you were born a chaotic time, and I don't know if you were born in World War II, if, I mean, if you were in that era, I don't know if you were born in the Vietnam or the Korean War, Iraq and War, Afghanistan, all these wars that we've had, we've always had unrest. We've always had unprecedented times, although right now, that word has been thrown out in every sentence that's on the news. I remember at the end of 2020 saying if I never heard that word again, unprecedented, <laughs> that it would be too soon. <laughs> and yet here we are. Everything is unprecedented. However, I would venture a guess that if we had to compare a warring giants and angels throwing rocks from heaven, they probably win in that. I would think so. That was pretty unprecedented. And then it's been hidden, just like those giants under the rocks. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen here a picture of the Serpent Mountain, just so that way you can see it. But that's right next to Gilgal Raphaim, where we were at, which is the Wheel, Wheel of the, the giants. giants. And all of that is within that valley. We've talked about this, the Shadow of Death, the Valley of Shades. But at the south end of that, how cool is that? That... That's where Mount Nebo is at, but it's the valley. God didn't bury Moses on the top of the mountain. It wasn't a mountaintop experience. Seeing it was. That's right. But, but it the, says he buried him in the valley. valley. Well, and really, so Moses and Elijah cap the bottom of that valley. And then Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he claims the top end of that. I mean, to me, that... Sandwiches. It sandwiches it all in. It claims. Well, and there's a lot of controversy over this whole thing with the Mount of Transfiguration because we don't know the mountain. It doesn't say. Uh, it, it comes right after Jesus has literally taken his disciples to Mount Hermon, and it's at the base of that where the Grotto of Pan and the Gates of Hell and all this is at. And that's when he asks them, Who do you say I am? You know, who do others say that I am? And the whole nine yards. And he says, But who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are Jesus the Messiah. Yes. And he says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Only the Holy Spirit. Only God could have told Peter that he was the Messiah, but he did that on purpose in front of all these deities on their mountain. Now, it goes a follow suit that it would be on top of that mountain, Mount Hermon, is where Jesus was transfigured, and that's where Moses and Elijah came. However, it is interesting, um, was it Luke? I think it's Luke, My where it says that they came down from Galilee, and then they went. So if they were in Galilee, now here's the problem. You have Galilee, you have the area of Galilee, and then you have the region of Galilee. If it's the region, they couldn't have been in 
Galilee at Mount Hermon and go to Galilee. Right. So if they didn't go to Galilee and they had to go somewhere else, where else would they have gone? And this was a very interesting concept. It's the Whitmore, Whitmore um, idea, but it was Chuck Missler who actually showed us this. He says that, this is his opinion, that um, he believes it could be the valley from Mount Nebo, right. or Mount Nebo, I should say, where the transfiguration took place because the valley, because he says that's where Elijah was Thinking up. translated, yes, which is a very big word for poof. <laughs> it's just taken up, Roger. And Moses was on the mountain and then went down into the valley, and that's where he was buried. So it would make sense that when Jesus goes to Mount Nebo, and he, that Moses and Elijah would be there. Makes you wonder what they were doing, though. Moses and Elijah and Jesus just... Having a staff meeting. Having a staff meeting. They were actually talking about what was to happen. And here's another, well, okay, so here's another thought. Because they weren't just talking about what was going to happen to Jesus right there at the beginning, but then they were probably talking about even farther future events. And that future events takes us all the way to the book of Revelation. Now, I have argued, along with many others, I found out, that we don't know who the two witnesses are. A lot of people have said it was Elijah and Moses, but I said I thought it was Enoch and Elijah because those are the two that didn't die. They didn't die. They would be the two witnesses. I didn't think about, um, there's an argument that Enoch not being Hebrew, not being Jewish. Right. Well, he wouldn't have been because it was before. It was before Jacob. It was before Abraham, Isaac. Before the 12 tribes. Yes, it was before all that. So technically he would have been a Gentile because actually Abraham was a Gentile before God called him. And these are two witnesses to the Hebrew people. Well, Elijah and Moses would be. And if they were the ones on the Mount of Transfiguration and if they were having this little staff meeting. Kind of makes sense. And they were talking about all these futuristic things. Yeah, I mean, it's a very solid argument. It's when, cool, the discussions that you can have. I mean, you really start digging into the scriptures. Because it doesn't change any of the... No, two witnesses are still going to come. Right. It could be Larry and Mo from the Three Stooges. I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. Probably not a lot of scriptural references to them. No. But it doesn't change the fact. But we can have intelligent conversation about it. We can. And we can disagree... And be fine. And be fine. Yeah. Imagine. What a what a novel concept. That we, we can disagree, disagree about stuff and and big feel be friends, friends and right. be able to go about our merry way. So what was your first concept? I, I or what was your first thought when you heard the stuff from Enoch? Because had you ever heard about the book of Enoch before? Had you ever even thought of Enoch even in the geology before? No. Genealogy. Okay, let me rephrase. Have you ever even... <laughs> I know we're talking about the rock. Have you... <laughs> had you ever even not only heard of the book, but had you even heard of Enoch in the genealogy? I had not. No, I hadn't. I hadn't, and I hadn't heard the, like what we talked about last time with the, the, the prophecy was literally built into it. I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, I had never read the Book of Enoch. Um, now that I have, I have more questions maybe than answers, which we'll continue to dig into. But what an amazing piece of writing. A lot of big concepts, but actually it was cool because there were times when I was reading through that and I was like, oh, I kind of remember references in scripture to those different places and it was just like I, I am not at a place where I can go oh that was Paul or oh that was yeah. Peter but just to recognize oh I've read that before oh I know what he's talking about or um, I'm excited as I'm reading the Bible more than to see that and even just to see in Jude where that was all linked um, well and that's a cool thing about Jude because we said last week two weeks ago that the first prophecy of in the Bible was really when Enoch named his son mm -hmm. because he'd had the revelation and he named him his death will bring right. destruction. But it's actually what Jude writes that is the first prophecy because it is a direct quote from Enoch and Enoch was before the flood. So it was the very first 
prophecy, and it was the prophecy of the fallen Rome. That's kind of cool. It really is. So yeah, it's an, it was it was an important work for me to read because it just opened up so much more, and um, I'm excited to dig into even more of some of the extra biblical texts. It was the first human prophecy. Because the very first prophecy, of course, was from God when he prophesies about the seed of the woman and the man. The, the seed of the woman and the seed of, of the, the servant. servant. But this is the first prophecy of man, which is cool. It is. And we'll talk more next week about what that means and how that is just all throughout. Excited about that. Me too. So how does this apply to your life and why do you care? Because we still deal with the fallen realm all the time. Oh yes, the 200 may be in chains right, below the surface, but there's still a lot of the fallen realm that are not part of that 200. And, and still they are still causing a lot of problem and they're part of this false teaching <clears throat> and they're trying to sow seeds of deceit and doubt and false teaching. And, you know, I... I think about all this, and I, I go back to that part in Enoch that just has always been um, one of my main things that I've wrestled with forever, that was after they got caught, you know, after everything had gone wrong, not one of the 200 asked for forgiveness. I know <coughs> this is in Enoch, but if you actually really, really read it, that was paraphrased, really read it, they were not asking for forgiveness at that time. No, they weren't. They were just wanting God to pardon what, what, <clears throat> what they'd done. They were sorry they got caught. They were sorry the things were going to happen to their offspring because they created it. Right. They created the mess and they didn't want the mess to go away. That's really what it was about. Right. God was squishing their plans and taking away their fun. Right. <clears throat> this was not a... Everything was so warped and... It was. Disturbed it, it was and disrupted. completely... Correct. And and they didn't, even after all the time, they did not ask for forgiveness. And then you think about Azazel, and you think about, you know, what's so bad about telling somebody how to do something, mm -hmm. you know? That was worse. I mean, you think about God destroyed an entire world with a flood because of what these 200 people had started. And yet... Azazel is treated even worse. worse. <laughs> this judgment it is, is worse. worse. Yeah, not only is the, the false teaching and the false leading us astray horrible, but that knowledge and the things that we were not meant to know, and they were continuing that and really leading us down a path of destruction. Mm-hmm. Very much so. So this actually brings us to where is this else found in the Bible and what does this have to do with us now in this times, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you go to Revelation, everybody's now looking at the book of Revelation. Oh, they are. If you go to chapter 9, verse 11, there is definitely a event that happens that is pivotal. It says, Abaddon, which could also be Apollo, Apollyon, which we argue could be Shemiaza, the destroyer, the angel of the abyss, one of them that's been chained down there. So this is what Revelation 9 says. So the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth, and the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss, to the gates of hell. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke of the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came out on the earth and were given power like that of a scorpion on the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who had, did not have the seal of God on their forehead. Now remember, there's going to be a seal also in Revelation, but that's from who? The Antichrist. The Antichrist, the mark of the beast. But this is the mark of God. So they could torment anybody, but not those that have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During these days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude 
them. This is very, very interesting because how long, now we talked about the flood was the reason for what? To destroy the Nephilim and All everything that was corrupt, everything that was totally corrupt. <clears throat> And the angel, angels, the watchers, had to watch them die. Do you know how long Noah was in the ark, but how long the waters had resided over the earth? About five months. Yeah, it's almost to the day. Five months, the water was covered the earth, and you have five months that these disembodied spirits are allowed to come out and torment the unbelievers. That is not a coincidence. That is actually there on purpose. For the same time frame that the angels had to watch their prodigy, their, their Nephilim, die. And suffer. And suffer. They allow them to come back for that exact same amount of time and torture the unbelievers. Torture the unbelievers. Nothing is happenstance. <laughs> and from the beginning of the book to the end of the book... <laughs> It is still there. It is. And it's all connected. And there's one thread that goes all throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Those keys <clears throat> that the angel, the key that the angel takes, that he goes down to open the bottomless pit. There's another mention of that key in the Bible that most people don't realize. Would that be the same key that Jesus got? Yes. When Jesus died and he went down to Tartarus... He preached to the captives, but he said, Behold, I hold the keys of hell and death, sin and death, mm -hmm. and I'm alive forevermore. Those keys are the ones that the angel, the star, gets and comes down and opens the abyss. A predetermined amount of time. So what was your thought? Maybe for you this is the first time you've ever heard that with the two goats, or maybe you knew about the two goats, you knew about Yom Kippur, but you never put the two and two together with Azazel. And why that goat is designated for him. And why the sin has been heaped on him. Well, because it even says that all of the sins, that's what God says in that moment. This is long before Yom Kippur and the Jewish people and all of that stuff. God says all of the sins will be on Azazel. Azazel will right. be, yeah, all the people sin. Mm -hmm. You did all of this. So I guess my point is we don't even know what all he did. <laughs> but it was bad. It was bad, and he continued. I mean, he didn't just purposely tell the people himself. He had to have let others or others in on it. They know, because that's where we're getting all this unbelievable technology, and a lot of it's not good. Just because you can do it doesn't mean that it should, should be, be done. done. Well, and I think that's, you know, when you talk about what do you do with that and why that's important today is because these there are still entities, maybe not those 200, but there are still entities that fell that are feeding us that information, that are giving us that knowledge. And that is, that's where all of this comes from. And if you look at the amount of advances in technology that yeah, we've had in the crazy. last couple of hundred years, I mean, I'm all for humanity being, you know, intelligent and all that stuff. But come on now. There is no way that we could come up with what we've come up with on our own. When you go from still fighting with swords and torches to all of a sudden an atomic bomb and the stuff that we have that we're doing in outer space and just you know there's oh there's so much technology and it just comes as a blink of an eye overnight mm -hmm. and we'll talk a little bit about how that happens yeah we will we're going to get into a lot more stuff later but but we wanted to give you an overview we've been talking about enoch we said we we're going to tell you about enoch so now you know you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what transpired, and that God didn't take it lightly. No, not at all. And um, good old Enoch was the go-between. He was a lawyer kind of between the two. But just like when we looked at with Balaam, he could only see what God told him. Absolutely. He didn't, he didn't try to sugarcoat it, sweet talk it, change it. He just told what the God had revealed to him. Mm -hmm. And said, sorry boys, you're on your own. Sucks to be you. <laughs> and this brings back a little full circle because Paul tells us that even when we think like, oh, what could we possibly do? This seems like, you know, the angels and the principalities of powers, they have all this power and they know all this knowledge and 
we are but mere little humans that are being pawns. You know, sometimes it can feel like that. Right. But this is what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. He says, don't you know we will judge angels? And if this is so, we could surely judge everyday matters. <laughs> how, how do you just go, huh? I can pick Cheerios for breakfast because I could judge angels. <laughs> it's like, oh, that is so opposite <laughs> end of the spectrum. It is. And the, what can you say? Oh, that's just. It's hard to wrap your mind around that for one. That means the very angels that did this to us, that, that have been causing all this problem, this is that we will be judging. That is powerful. And how will we judge? We judge, the righteous will judge. And you're only righteous if you're in and through Christ. And how has Christ always pretty much judged with grace, but there still is judgment. Right. There is a line. And we are going to get into that next week. Absolutely. So we're going to leave you with this week with the book of Enoch to chew on. That's a lot of information. It is. And you know, one last thing to go along with this, as far as like feeling like you can not just walk around in fear for the next week because there's all of this. Um, healthy respect is one thing, but what is, what, why does it say that we shouldn't, we don't have to fear? Love casts out all fear. And what is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And who is in us is Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I have already conquered sin and death. I have overcome the world. He's holding on to the keys. <laughs> and he'll only give away the keys at the appointed time. And if you have accepted Christ, guess what? You're not going to be around for that time. Right. In chapter 9, all the better. And if you have not, I would highly encourage you to spend this time seeking, knocking, asking, as we said last week, and talk to Christ. See what he has to say to your heart. Because trust me, you do not want to be on the Day of Judgment. No, you do not. It's not about works. It's not about how good of a person you are. It's very simply accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because when he gets so upset about the defiling of the blood, it's because the only blood that matters is Christ. Right. And it is for the redemption and the salvation of all. Amen. Amen. So until next week. Bye. Bye.